brothers and sisters. Today is a special day. I have one of my teachers here on the podcast, someone who I've learned a lot from, who's guided me on the path, and <laughs> I'm sure I've played my part in his life as well, <laughs> and uh, we get a chance to get on here, share some of our thoughts and ideas, and have some fun, tell yeah. a story. So welcome, Ted Decker, my good friend, <laughs> to the podcast. Ben. It's so good to be here, Marcus. I mean, Marcus is actually your real name, right? That's my family name. That's your family name, but it's Aubrey. Passed down. Aubrey is the chosen speaking name. Speaking of speaking of Marcus Mumford, another friend of mine just put out his single for his new album today called "Believe." Mm -hmm. Really cool song. Very different than this is Mumford and Sons. Yeah, mm -hmm. a very very spiritual guy, which come you know his lyrics carry his heart, and he's in this place of searching. And I mean, you got to check out this song "Believe." It's different for them. Cool. So Marcus Mumford. My plug for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> a little shout out there. A little shout yeah, out. I like when they instill a little conscious vibe into the Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some good music. But it's so it's so good to be here and just to talk about life and stuff. Agreed. What makes us tick and what makes us talk. Agreed. I'm with that. So let's start from the beginning then, because you had yeah. a very interesting life. Your personal history is quite unique. Uh, so yeah, tell us about that. Well, you know. I grew up in the jungles. I mean, it's interesting. You go to the jungle. You've been to the jungle down in Peru mm -hmm. a number of times. I actually was born in the jungle. So my first language was a native tongue called Dani. And um, they were cannibals. So I was, when I, actually, when I was six years old, they killed my parents' coworkers. And, uh, and yeah, I ate them. Of course, me being that's an only, intense childhood story. Not many people yeah. get to say that. They don't. That's not part of their personal history. Well, we all have our crazy, crazy, wacky stories. Most of us keep them quite secret. But I'm not just talking about their history, but whatever happens in their minds. Mm -hmm. That's really our story. We live our stories in our mind, only, and people only see a very small part of it. Um, my, mine's quite stark in some respects, uh, but no different than most most people's really this is what i discover we're all the same in mine i was born in a jungle of indonesia um amongst cannibals and um there you know is an animistic tribe um very different beliefs than my than my, my parents beliefs so they went there as missionaries mm -hmm. um and so i i come from those roots you know 70 percent of the people in this country at some point were or are christian whatever that means so it's like in, in a sense we've all we have this kind of imprinting on us well my, that imprinting on me was deeply challenged from the time i was you know two three years old but the most in, the most um uh, i would say challenging time of my life was when i was six my parents sent me away to a boarding school and i and I remember leaving this beautiful, idyllic kind of uh, existence in the jungle where, you know, no shirt, no shoes, throwing a pair of shorts. I'm out in the jungle. I'm just literally living a kind of a, a, like in a Garden of Eden of sorts. Mm -hmm. Really, it was. No fears of anything. I hadn't yet discovered uh, that which caused fear, you know. I mean, everything's okay. There's no danger, so to speak. You haven't really been introduced to danger yet when you're very, very young. Now, at different people at different ages, you know, we, we come to that point where suddenly we are confronted by great danger in our life, and we, we kind of lose our innocence in that, in that moment. For me, that moment really came when I was six years old, and I was essentially abandoned by, by my parents. They were just doing what everybody did at the time. Was that triggered from when the, when the tribe killed their coworkers? It, it, ate them? it wasn't triggered by that, but it did. It happened at the same time. Yeah. Now, by the way, the, the, the natives killing my parents' coworkers and eating them and all, to me, this wasn't really an event in my life. I was just a part of that system. Uh -huh. I was too naive so and your innocent. Identif your identification was not either with your, that, your parents' structure or the tribal structure? It just seemed not normal Not really. It point? was with my friends, and, and right. my friends were all native. I didn't know really any, a very few white people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was, as a young child, just trying to be like those around me, like all of us. I was trying to run as fast as they could run down the mountain and beat the rainstorm as it was pounding, you know, creeping over the range. Because once it hit, you know, the trails and the slopes became way too slippery, at least for me. I mean, yeah. it was just a crazy kind of, I was like a little, little Tarzan character. Right. I mean, you know, I don't know how else to describe it. 
you know, or like Mowgli from the Jungle Book. Or <laughs> Seriously, I mean, my ambition when I was a little kid was how fast can I get from that tree to that tree without touching the ground? And how many trees can I cross going from branch to branch to, I mean, this was, you know, what made up my life. And then I was thrust in, I was ta I ripped out of that environment and thrown into this, uh, put on a plane and put into an environment far from home. And it was, um, it was a crushing experience to me. Suddenly I realized, I remember the first night, I, I was suddenly alone in this room with like 20 other boys in bunk beds. I knew no one. And I suddenly realized, oh, oh my God, I'm not going to see my, I'm alone. Where are my parents? Where's my father? And I remember it just hit me and I crawled out of bed. I was overwhelmed. And I snuck out of the room and I went down the, down the walkway to where the girls' dormitory was. Smart and, move. Yeah. A trend that <laughs> continued throughout later life. Yeah, well, in this... <laughs> find the girls. They'll always keep you safe, Mother yeah. Earth. But, you know, I was actually looking for my sister in this uh -huh. case. And... I knocked on the door, they brought her to me, but she couldn't come outside. And I said, your name was Eva. I said, Eva, I'm, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm all, I'm all alone. There's no one here to, to take care of. I, I just lost my moorings. I was mm -hmm. completely afloat in this raging sea of insecurity and doubt. And, and I said, can you come out and hold me? And she said, no, I'm not allowed out. And she began to cry and I was crying. I said, well, can I come in? She says, no, you're not allowed coming in. And, Someone then took, I remember someone took me by the hand, you know, one of the adults, led me back to my room and said, you're just going to have to get used to this. You're going to have to suck it up and get used to this. It's going to be okay. Put me back in bed and I cried myself to sleep. Um, now, I only remember that first night, but I was with a friend last, a couple of years ago who grew up with me and they said, you were the worst. <laughs> For months, every night, you cried yourself to sleep. And he said, you know, he said, it was horrible. Wow. I don't remember any of that. I've blocked mm -hmm. all that out of my memory. Now, I bring up that story to say this. I realize now that my entire life since then has been essentially a search for my identity. Who am I? Where did I come from? Who is my father? Who is my source? Where do I find security? Everything I've done in my entire life, now I'm 50, you're just over 50 now, and I've you know, had an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. But my entire journey, just like yours, has been really a search for significance, meaning, and meaning for love. Everybody's journey is. Everybody's journey. Mine was, I was set on a course in a very stark way at age six. And it was, the, and it really was, where do I come from? Who is my father? Where do I find security? What is my meaning? Very specifically. So, you know, from there forward, I... I built walls around myself and I began to uh, protect myself from anything that might hurt me. We all do the same thing, yeah, once we've been deeply wounded like that. And I began to search for myself. It, I, there's this old storybook I remember reading as a child. It was like this little bird going around. I think it was Dr. Seuss, actually. But it was like this little bird going around to all these different animals saying, are you my mother? Are you my mother? And, you know, he'd go to the elephant. He didn't know. Mm -hmm. And the elephant would say, no, I'm not your mother. And he kept looking and looking and looking and looking. I feel like I've been looking for my mother, for my father. I'll make them one, the same, my, my entire life. It's been an erratically obsessive search for me that's taken me through all kinds of spiritual traditions and, and, um, and philosophy and ideology through success. I mean... When I finally came to this country at age 18, I saw the way it worked, and I said, okay, I'm gonna do it the American way, which means I'm gonna succeed. And I knew I can succeed in this country because I, you know, I cut my teeth, not only in the jungles, but on the streets of Indonesia where everyone traded and bartered and sold, and mm -hmm. I became a very good, yeah, I could sell myself to <laughs> anyone, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so in this country, I kind of rose the corporate ladder I'm just giving you a real quick, real quick history here. Rose the corporate ladder, became a director of marketing for a fairly large healthcare company at age by the by the time I was 23, way way in over my head. But I, you know, that's how it goes. You throw yourself off that cliff and you figure sure. out how to unfold your wings as you go, and uh, very very successful. But always, I was never at home. I was never. It was always a search, a search. This deep gnawing sense that there's way more to life than this, and. I, so I'd pursue one pleasure, and all pleasure is beautiful, but 
it can never fully satisfy you until you realize who you are. And I, I realized that very, very early on in age, when I was very young. Um, I kept seeking and seeking. I became very successful. I made millions of dollars at a very young age. Threw it all away. Made it again. I mean, this is just my journey. Great risk taker. Right. Um, actually, I think one reason why you and I connect so uh, we connected so early was because we have very similar journeys in that respect. Um, you well, know, the willingness, the the desire to search, and then the willingness to take risk and explore whatever comes. Yeah. You know, but vastly different. Yeah, exactly. Childhood experience. Yeah. But nonetheless, you know, very vastly different just in form. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So whether or not my I mean, the people I grew up with were naked. The the men wore nothing but a gourd, which is basically a penis sheath, like a hollowed out squash, cucumber, like mm-hmm. you know, like a zucchini. Hardened. Um and you know, the and you know, with their scrotum just hanging there. So nakedness to them was very different than it is to us. So, I mean, to see someone's balls or scrotum just hanging there is nothing. In fact, the most common greeting amongst the people I grew up with is, and they would grab your balls, which essentially means, oh, I surrender myself to you. I will I will eat your penis. That's how we start every chief's meeting at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go around in a circle. And, and yeah, <laughs> but it was very natural. It was just right. like, uh, it was their way of, you know, it was their way of their deepest expression of affection mm-hmm. and uh, really surrender to each other. And um, so they were, the women were naked except for grass skirts that went down maybe mid-thigh or down to just above the knee, um, nothing up top. So um, consequently, for a woman... To be seen with, say, shorts on, which showed their thighs, was deeply erotic. But n- in bare-breasted, n- that's nothing. Right. These are all conditioned in us, right? So to walk around uh, with shorts on, for a girl to walk around with shorts on, you know, you're likely to be raped. It's it's a display. It's like a girl here walking around, um, basically ha- naked, but looking for attention, like I'm right. available. Sending that signal in that culture to wear shorts, even jeans, because it showed this. So, in it, essentially, the thighs were the, were the forbidden fruit. You know, isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> whatever isn't shown. Whatever isn't shown, it is the forbidden place. It's whatever is forbidden. Is that that's what yeah. which, uh, that that's what attracts us. Men kept it real simple, just the dick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, it was like okay, the there only you go. Forbidden part. Um, yeah. So I. You know, I, I had this unique window into the world where I saw traveling, you know, be, bouncing between there and in, in America and wherever else I would travel. That everybody just was essentially conditioned by their own, by their own culture, and things that they thought of as either taboo and or um, sacred were largely imprinted on them by their culture. Sure, are, it's like language. It's a different language. Yeah, it's the co-created dream that, <clears throat> that the Toltecs call the mitote. What we buy into is yeah, is what is what is right, what is wrong, what is yeah, what are the mores, what are the ideas that we have that guide yeah. our lives. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for me, for me, you know, it was in the context of searching for what I knew to be. I don't, I don't know why I was kind of born into this world with this predisposition. But I, I am one of those who are was absolutely driven to, to to let go of ultimately let go of all that I thought I was to discover who I truly was. Again, well, well you started off with such distinct opposite frameworks. You had yeah. you know the Christian missionary framework, yeah, and then trying to push into this very raw tribal framework, you know, and so already you're a child of com- two completely different worlds. So yeah. it made sense that. At having both ends of the polarity, you yeah, know, everything was up for investigation. I mean, and I and I investigated it all. I mean, I when I came back to the United States, I threw away all of my my the faith that I had in Christianity. Essentially, became an atheist. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and but I found that not believing in Source or God at all it was actually ultimately just another kind of faith in something else which is simply your own self isolated from source from any kind of beginning um and which 
which ultimately requires, in a way, as it, well, it requires as much faith, just in a different, in a different system. And and ultimately deeply unsatisfying to me, just from a very philosophical level. So for me, let me let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. This kind of sets this kind of sets everything up for me. There was once a spiritual teacher who was. You may have heard this story before. I'm sure you have because we've talked so much. But um, there was a spiritual teacher walking the savanna, and he had with him a small boy. And his task that day was to introduce the boy to his father, to his source, to God. So they came to a field where there was a pride of lions. And he said, you see that lion? We're going to say that that lion is your father. This is where you came from. This is your origin. And you see over there across the field, there is a hyena. Can the hyena threaten the lion? And the boy thinks about it. He knows his... His teacher is very crafty, but this is obvious. So he says, yes, of course, he can bite him. And there's many hyenas. They can take him down and kill him. Ah, says the teacher, let's make the lion bigger. Because you, your father, your source is infinite. And the hyena, which represents all evil, is finite. Let's make the lion bigger. Let's make him as big as the field. Now can the hyena threaten the lion. And the boy says, yeah, yes, yes, he could still bite him like a small mouse. And that says the teacher, let's make the lion bigger. Let's make him as big as the entire forest. Now can the hyena, who's still the same size, threaten the lion. And the boy thinks again, he says, yes, yes, he can like a flea. Ah, says the teacher, let's make the lion bigger. Let's make him as big as the entire world. Let's make him as entire as the sun, as a thousand suns. Let's make him as big as the entire cosmos. And that hyena is still the same size. Now, can that hyena threaten the lion? And the boy says, no, no. And the teacher says, can he even bother the lion? And the boy thinks, he says, no. And the teacher says, no, this is your father. And the only thing greater than his power is his intimate love for you because you are made of his fabric. And this is how the boy learned who his father was. So the idea, Aubrey, that we that before the space-time continuum even existed, there was essence, there was being, there was, I'll call it God. Mm -hmm. You can call it, some people, whatever word you want to use. For me, I say God. Okay, so some people don't like that term. Well, whatever, it's just a word. It's just a word. We're all using ant language anyway to try, to try to describe, you know, the processes, you know, inside of a computer. In a way, our language is so limited. Yep. So I'll call that God. Infinite able for all that exists came out of that out came out of that that source god and before he and i'll say he created all that exists in this space-time continuum called this universe that we now live in and are part of he was complete was he somehow incomplete no he's infinite this is my fundamental belief of and he is love he is love. He is complete. Nothing can be added to him or taken away from him. He cannot be threatened. He cannot be bothered. He can never be disappointed in anything, especially his own children. So how then did evil come to be? What then is, why is it then we, that we struggle? What is it that we you know, uh, you know we, we, we suffer in this life, yeah? We have Sure. relationship difficulties and we have cancer and we have death and and we actually live in it and it's, it's like it's in the context of this life that we feel this terrible threats all these things that we think are going to somehow compromise us when truly this is not who we truly it's not who we truly are what is that um, that comes into us and this is essentially the, the the great question that plagues all of us why do I suffer 
and how do I stop suffering? How can I be happy, full of joy, love, and peace? And it's really the only, only, only journey that we take. And it all is found in our identity, in knowing who we are, not who we think we are. And that is the path of all spiritual traditions. So, and, and I have, you know, I think we'll have an opportunity to explore the answers to those questions you raised. But just to go back to the chronology of things, that is the ultimate place that, that you've arrived and that I've arrived, both independently arriving at similar ideas and then sharing and strengthening each other's ideas yeah. through that concept. But at, at the point in the chronology, where did you discover that? Because that is not part of any system that you had so far in the story that you had told um, been a part of it's not part of the maybe it's somewhat pertaining to the tribal concept of it but it's probably beyond the scope of that it's certainly not the traditional christian viewpoint certainly not that of probably your missionary parents um, and it's definitely not part of the capitalistic success-driven atheism framework that you were developing so at a certain yeah. point where did you start to discover <clears throat> these what now holds is the core tenets these fundamental truths of your spirituality how did that come to be okay well first of all i'll say that these fundamental truths are actually the fundamental truths of almost all systems there is just not languaged this way mm -hmm. and so we tend to get caught up in a, a religious system or some kind of spiritual system that has its own language and ultimately that language fails us so ultimately, this is why they say spirituality can never be taught. It can only be learned or experienced. It's this way. It's like, let's say you take an apple. This plays into your question, so I'll get to your, I'll answer that question. But let me start by saying, if you take an apple or let's make it an avocado. Okay? Delicious. I don't know. Delicious. We both love avocados. <laughs> now you can take that avocado and you can dissect it. Okay. And you can study it, and you can put language around it, describe it, and you can talk to people about it. You can actually form entire institutions around the study of this particular avocado. And, but in truth, you don't know that avocado. You haven't experienced that avocado until you eat it, until you bite it, until you taste it. You only know about it, but you don't know it. So in the ancient Hebrew, you know, Hebrew tradition, to know somebody is to have sexual intercourse with them, to become one with, okay, to experience them. So you can know all about somebody and you can even worship them in a certain sense. But until you actually know them and experience it for yourself, you're only talking about it. You're only knowing about it. Yeshua had an incredible teaching on this. He said, this is eternal life, to know the Father. And the word know that he used was to have intimate communion with. So to the extent that you are knowing who you are and who your source is, your Father is, you are, live, you are able to live in, in this eternal expanse, what he called eternal life, which is now, which is the kingdom of heaven within you. This is his way of putting the same thing. So the kingdom of heaven or the eternal realm of the Father, of all that is, is now. It's within you. And it can only be experienced that it, you know, as you know it, as opposed to knowing about it. So the answer to all spiritual questions comes in experiencing your tr your, yourself and your source in intimate union, mm -hmm. God. But so many of the institutions have taken out the rituals the ability for people to experience that and said say a lot of times for their own benefit oh, just listen to me i'll tell you which way to go just show up here at this time and yeah. follow these rules and otherwise you'll get punished and this is this is the way it is but yeah the real true spirituality as you said and as i've known and experienced you have to feel it you have to know it you have yeah. to be a part of it. you have to join with that yeah and then it's not you know people will ask me well well how do you know these things that you're saying i know them because i know them you know, I've been there. I've, I've touched tasted. them. I've tasted them. Yeah. You know, I understand it in a way that's beyond what anybody told me. Yeah. You know, it's not because I read this book or I did this thing. Those things can help shape and language and codify this information and help you explain it and explain it to yourself. And 
it's very helpful. I'm not trying to downgrade that, but without knowing it intimately yourself, that's right. It's challenging. So at some point, you had to, you know, do that yourself. You had to take a bite of that avocado yeah. for yourself. <clears throat> when did that? When did that come? I think that I, that all through my life, I was tasting, you know, taste and see that God is good. You can only see that when you as you taste it. So I had little tastes all along, but mm-hmm. those tastes all along were were confused and confounded by the system of religion and of the world and all the language. In fact, the language got in the way. So ultimately I got to a point where I had to unlearn so much in order to know. Mm-hmm. I remember a time in deep meditation. I mean, my pathway is one of meditation and contemplation where I I go into this process of letting go of all that I think I know about the avocado to taste it, to know it, to actually <clears throat> experience it intimately. And I was tasting it here and there. I can think of many times through my life, and actually everyone can when they think mm-hmm. about it, but they don't know how to actually contextualize it. For me, I came to a point of complete ruin. In other words, the more successful I became in life, the more dissatisfied I became with it. Many, many people I know that are very, very successful in life follow this path, especially people that are, you know, I mean, I have my own kind of fame in my own corner. I've sold over 10 million novels. I've written, you know, over 30 of them. I have millions of fans. So I'm I'm in a position where I, uh, you know, I, I do a signing and, you know, I'm signing for three, four, five hours, you know, people who are just can't wait to meet me. Mm-hmm. And during all of that, though, I played the role of like author and I had all my fans and this was supposed to give me great satisfaction. But all along, even as I was doing it, I says, no, this, there's so much more than this. Somehow even this experience is cauterizing the true power I have within me. And it was only when, when I came to a point where the systems of the world failed me utterly, meaning they failed my deep desire to know my true power as the son of my father. When I say father, I'm talking about my source. Mm-hmm. As that person flowing with more power than I knew or could possibly imagine I had with love and joy and peace, really is kind of like a divine alchemy where you we have so much. We have so much power, which is actually ultimately cauterized and uh, blocked by our pursuit of lesser gods, I'll put them that way, which are beautiful gifts in this life, all the pleasures of us. They're sure. beautiful, beautiful, but they master us. We don't master them. We become their slaves. So for me, it was in that, in that breaking. I was almost suicidal at one point. Your, it, your dark night of the soul, as you've referred to it. I, you can't explain this to somebody. How could you, someone who's so successful, you have the heart, the, the car, you know, I mean, I was driving at that time, I forget, an Aston Martin. I mean, I mean, I had everything in my life. I had a beautiful, how everything. There was nothing in my life that I'd say, well, I, you know, I, I didn't, I guess I could have a, you know, a citation. I mean, I could have a, you know, a jet. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, this or that, more toys, but I, I'd already reached the point where I realized I'd already traveled everywhere in the world, taking the most exotic vacations you could imagine. I kept, I ran out of vacations to take. It would take me days to figure out where to go next because I'd been everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, I'll go to that Four Seasons Resort in that particular place and design this vacation where I'm in the middle of the jungle and there I will sleep in, you know, these $5,000 a night, whatever. I mean, very expensive, sure. accommodate, the whole thing. And I would do them, and I would, and ultimately they were they were essentially beautiful experiences. But deep inside of myself, I knew that the more I tasted of that, the more I realized that I'm I'm selling out to something. Not selling out. See, there's nothing wrong with any of those yeah. pleasures, but there's something so much deeper that's lacking from that. That's lacking from that. And it's hard. It's hard for people listening to this to kind of understand that and if they don't have a lot of friends in that circle with that capability and have seen this for their first time. Again, they don't know it. To them, that sounds like blasphemy. Man, if I could do that, I'd be happy as yeah. shit. Yeah, maybe for a little bit. you know. But ultimately, the deeper calling, which yeah. touches all of us, would take <clears throat> over. I mean, I remember I was at a birthday party in uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah. And it was thrown by a billionaire and had bil- all kinds of billionaires there. 
I mean, probably one of the largest collection of wealthy people, super wealthy people in the world. And I could just feel the sadness seeping through everyone behind the smiles, behind everything. I didn't really know anybody there, so I just got to kind of quietly observe. And you see that repeatedly. And it's not everybody. It's not that wealth causes unhappiness, but no. it's not a measure at all. It's actually, it's a, it's a bit of a sticky little lure and a little trap that actually makes it sometimes more difficult. Because when I went to Africa, for example, and we're hanging out with the people living in the Soweto slum, for example, one of the hardest places in the world to live, yeah. their general level of happiness was clearly higher than at that Greenwich, Connecticut tent. Just to give a frame of reference, at, at that show they had John Fogarty of CCR opening the music of the night, then they moved on to John Bon Jovi, and then they closed the night with Sting at a personal birthday party. I mean, this is the level of opulence. Yeah, you can't get that higher was, than that. Like, what, I mean, what else what, can you what have? What else is there? But, no. you know, there's people banging on fucking tin cans and yeah. drums in the Soweto <laughs> slum, and they're way happier, yeah. dancing way harder, and enjoying life better. So the correlation between money and happiness is... Have you seen that documentary, Happy? I haven't, no. Um, I think we've talked about it before, but I think I forget who it was. that uh, It was like a 20-year study done by a Gallup organization. Um out of a cane, this documentary called Happy. And, you know, worldwide, or in the United States specifically, once you get above, I think it's like $60,000 of income, the more money you make, the less happy you are. It confounds the mind. Mm -hmm. But once your basic needs are taken care of, there's no correlation between money and happiness. There is for time. It's kind of like a drug. Yeah, there is for a time that pleasure. But there's always the morning following or the days to follow. And yet we keep, you know, I mean, so... Well, the it, pursuit, it's the growth that's exciting, you know, but the yeah. pursuit gets exponential. So yeah. from 100 to to $1,000 in your bank account, you know, that feels that feels really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Because you, you gained in actual money $900, but it felt like a 10 times your amount of net wealth. And then from then to get the same kind of feeling, you got to go from 1000 to 100,000. Yeah, it never ends. You know, and then you'll get that same feeling. But then at that point, you got to go from 100,000 to 10 million. Right. And then you get that feeling. But then at that point, you know, isn't that it's true with all? Isn't that true with food? Yeah. So you first, you know, you've never e eaten, you know, a $100 steak with lobster or whatever. And the first time you do it, it's like, oh my, you're in heaven. <laughs> well, the hundredth time, it's like you're looking for something else. Yeah. There's always got to be more, or wealth is the same way. It, all, really, relationship is the same way. All yeah. relationships are the same way. I've heard the term called hedonic <clears throat> tolerance. You know, yeah. like building tolerance to anything, any kind of drug, any kind of pleasure, there's a tolerance level. You even hear it with rock stars who say, you know, at a certain point, even having one hot girl to fuck wasn't enough. I needed five, six. I needed them to be doing crazy things. Like to even get off, to even get aroused, yeah. you know, it required this, you know, this escalation. It, we probably felt a little bit of that in our own, you know, drunken porn journeys where we've gone through and had to escalate to the point where we're like, what the hell am I doing? Where am I? Yeah. What is this strange world that I've found myself in trying to push that pleasure button yeah, farther, it, farther it, it down just, the road? It just, it just keeps moving. I yeah. mean, this is no different for, for any, everyone's the same on this, you know, um, we, we have different drugs. We'll call all these the drugs of life. None of these pleasures, okay, I mean, you can't say that food is bad or that money's bad mm -hmm. or this, whatever, car. I mean, you name it. No, no, of course not. Everything's permissible, but not everything serves you. Not everything is, is beneficial. This is an, a saying, an ancient saying by the Apostle Paul. And it's like, it's true. It's like depending where you are in life, um, you know, you, you get to determine one thing, and that is what is, what are you, are you mastering life? Or are you being a slave to it? I had to come to a point of breaking in my own in my in my own journey where I found this deep place of just letting go. And what it was was this letting go of everything that I thought would give me security, safety, my own identity, everything that I thought of as myself, my roles, letting go of myself, my false self. False self is a word banded around a lot by many different different traditions, but we'll just call it, some call it denying yourself. What you're denying is this, essentially, the false self, okay? The, 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 the costume that you live in to discover who you really are. So there's nothing wrong with the false self. 
It's just that it can't, it, it can't satisfy you because you are truly a spiritual being, only temporarily taking a journey in this costume we call the body. And so to the extent that the body rules you, this, to the extent this world masters you, you are a slave. And you're always searching, for, looking for your emancipation, for your freedom, mm -hmm. and never able to find it in the systems of the world. So here's where the teaching comes. You let go of everything that you think you are to discover who you truly are. That's the point that I reached a number of, number of years ago. Through pain. Through, through pain. Suffering, through the dark but, night. And, and, and it's, it's okay because what happens is it's like you can call this purification. You can call this burning away that chaff that you had mistake as your identity to discover that you are an immortal diamond beneath it all. You are gold. But to the extent we put our identity in the things uh, of this world, as long as we put our identity in them, we become slave to them. We're much, much, much greater than that. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are made of the fabric of infinite divinity, of God. We have the power to master this life, to have dominion over all. But instead, we are the servant and the slave of it. Yeshua taught it this way. He says, you cannot serve two masters. You get to either serve one or the other. One will, you will always despise one and love the other. So if you are being mastered by life, you cannot truly love your true essence. You are the light of the world, he teaches. But you've covered that light up with this shell. He called it a bowl. And so you live in darkness. You stumble around trying to discover who you are. And how deep is that darkness? It's not that you're not the light of the world. You are. It's just you become blind to it. Right. So then all of life comes, the pathway into freedom is always tied to perception. If your eye is clear and you see who you are, your whole life, your body, Yeshua put it this way. Again, I go back to his teachings because he, although vastly misunderstood by so many Christians, his teachings are so pointed and so freeing in so many ways, if properly understood. And he put it this way, your, your eye, your perception of your reality, your eye is the lamp. It shows you your body. The eye is the lamp of the body, your earthly experience. Your perception shows you, will show you your earthly experience. If your perception is clear, your whole body, your whole earthly experience will be full of light. If your perception is not clear, that light within you will be dark. And how deep is that darkness? So who are you seeing today? Are you seeing yourself as the roles you play in life? Like, are you, I'm, am I a writer? Am I a husband? Am I a famous persona? Am I a wealthy person? Am I all these things? Um, or I am, am I truly the light of the world, the son of my father, only playing the roles for a short time of writer, of man, of husband, of whatever, spouse? Yeshua taught, unless you let go of everything, he said, unless you hate your mother, your father, your wife, your children, you cannot follow me. No Christian knows what to do with that teaching. But within this tradition, his tradition, and the one we're speaking of right now, it's so plain. To the extent you identify with the, your role as I am a successful businessman, you'll, you'll never really truly understand your true identity as the light of the world. Because your eyes are distracted, you are perceiving yourself as something far less than you truly are. Mm -hmm. And so then you are enslaved by it. You'll continue to, continue to stumble in darkness, searching for yourself where you can't be found. You are the light of the world. So be who you are. Yeah, and so much of that opens you up to the vulnerability and the turbulence and all of these things that you subject yourself to when you identify with all of these other factors. I mean, that is, that is where all of this suffering comes from is from yeah. is from identity because as you said our core self our core self is like a diamond and the rest of the world is full of pillows you know there's nothing that could actually harm it 
But instead, yeah. when you identify with this other part of yourself, you open yourself up to vulnerability. Vulnerability to, oh, I can't believe he said this. Or, oh, I can't believe the stock market went down. Or whatever thing that you're tied to, yeah. you know, eventually will be the root of your your deepest unhappiness. Yeah. And it's not that, and I think it's really important to say, it's not that you have to give all that up. I actually personally think that's kind of the easy way out, is to go to live in a in an ashram somewhere and give up on a life altogether and just say, okay, I'm this diamond and I'm just going to sit up here on this shelf. I think it's kind of a cop-out to a certain degree because I think we are here to experience life to the fullest. Yeah. And I think the framework and the language that I've always liked is, um, you know, the Toltecs had an idea of that part of your life being your controlled folly, like understanding that what it is, it's, it's all, it's all a game. It's all silly. It's all fun. It's all, it's going to a show. It's yeah. enjoying yourself at the carnival. It's playing little games and, and feeling the fun and laughing and enjoying it. But you know, it's just, it's, it's kids games. Yeah. It doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy it. doesn't mean you shouldn't be a kid, you know, but understand what that is and then what, you truly are. Yeah. You know. Well, the thing of it is, I, Aubrey, I agree that I, absolutely that all that exists here was created, exists for uh, for us to actually enjoy because and to love. The problem is not what exists around us. The problem is the fact that we're enslaved by it. And so our journey is one to no longer be mastered by it, but rather to... You, the, in fact, the only way you can truly enjoy, truly, you'll find I don't care how else you spend it. The only way you can truly enjoy all the gifts in life is to have dominion over them. Let, let me tell you another story. Here's a story that will probably maybe surprise you and a lot of your listeners, and especially a lot of Christians. And um, I, many, many of, of your listeners in this podcast grew up in some form of Christian tradition guaranteed, mm -hmm. especially in this country. And many of them may have rejected that. But let me tell you from the ancient story, um, here's the story of how we came to be how we are. Okay, in the beginning, God created all that is and how good it was. And in this place, he created a perfect garden. Okay, this mytholo mythological garden of perfection. And in this garden, he placed man. Okay, man is male and female. We'll call him man. We'll call that Adam. He created Adam. Okay, and he had communion directly with Adam. Adam walked with him and talked with him, you know, in the story. Take it as a story. Just get past the, all the labels and the language and follow the story. There was no judgment. Adam, in that place, had no judgment. He really had no preferences. An apple was beautiful. An orange was beautiful. It, he wouldn't judge the apple and say, it's better than the orange, because that would be a form of judgment, wouldn't it? There was no judgment or grievance. There was or, nothing that he did not like. He did not know to not like anything. All was good. There was only perfection. Just follow me. Idyllic existence in direct communion with the, with the Father. He was made in the likeness of God. He was made in the fabric of God. God, therefore, glorified his name, glorified his identity by making you in his likeness. He made you, and so he then manifested himself on earth through you. Yeah? You get the picture? Got the picture. There's the picture. And into this place came this serpent, the father of lies. And he came to man, man, woman. I'm just going to say man. He came to Adam, and he said, in the story, it was Eve, but I'm just going to say Adam. He said, you can be like God if you eat of this fruit, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But of course, this was ridiculous because Adam was already like God. So the first lie spun by that serpent is, was that you're not like God. But you can be like God if you only eat of this fruit called the knowledge of good and evil. So then Adam took that fruit. Now imagine a round fruit, half of it's white, half of it's black. The white is bright as the sun. That's all love and goodness. The black is like a deep abyss. So you put your 
hand around this fruit, your, your thumb might vanish into the blackness and your fingers might be, you know, this beautiful light just swallows them up. And you pick this up and this is the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam, wanting to be a god of his own making, bit into this fruit and consumed the knowledge of good and evil. And the first thing that happened was that he judged. He blamed. He felt, the first thing he blamed and he judged was himself. He felt naked. He judged himself. For the first time, he thought, oh no, I'm naked. I shouldn't be naked. This is self-judgment. The second thing was he blamed the woman. You made me do it. And so grievance and judgment entered the world because of the first Adam. And when you were born, you were born into this system of judgment and grievance. Were you not? Were we not all? This is all very mystical. We don't know how it all works, but we cannot deny the fact that we were born into a system of judgment and grievance. But there came into this existence, by the way, this happened before the foundation of the earth, outside of space and time, but we're going to put it within space and time, okay? Mm -hmm. There came in a second Adam. And the second Adam was Yeshua in the Christian tradition. It was Yeshua. The one who actually was the Son of God who created all that exists. He came to redeem all of creation, cosmos, back into himself. And he went to another garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, where the first Adam had said, Not your will, but mine. I will take a, on a will of my own making and become my own God and take on the knowledge of good and evil and judgment myself. The second Adam, being Yeshua, went into the Garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, but yours. Now, no, very few people know this, but in the Gospels, there's this weird scene where a week before Jesus was killed, a voice came from heaven. Jesus cried out and said, Father, glorify your name, glorify your identity once more. And a voice was returned and all those heard it. It's a very, very mystical and beautiful moment. The Father said, I have glorified my name before. I have glorified my identity. And I will glorify it again. Meaning, I once made man in my own likeness. I made man in my own likeness, but he became a God unto himself. He was my likeness on earth. And so I glorified my identity in him. And I will do that again. The death and resurrection of Yeshua was the glorification of of the Father's identity in us by putting the old Adam once again to death and rising again. <clears throat> you know, we've, our resurrection is that we've, we've, we've been risen. We've risen with Christ, with Yeshua, restored into the Garden of Eden. We now live in the Garden of Eden. We just don't see it. We're blinded by judgment and grievance to what we truly are in this moment and where we live in this moment. And, and so we see our suffering. journey is back to that garden. And I think it's important here for to clarify for the listeners, because once you start to bring Jesus back into the biological criteria, we have to understand and kind of unpack <clears throat> these other myths. And I think one of the things that you know you've impressed upon me, and I know you can explain it better, is that this was you know, well, I guess, I guess the story of Jesus as, as a human, I mean, he was representative of what all of us could be. It wasn't that he was special. He just accessed that specialness inside himself to a degree that was heightened. Yeah, Jesus had this, <clears throat> I like calling him Yeshua because for me, Jesus has become a name which has lost significance in our culture. I mean, it's become an, ex it's like a, I, my whole journey was to rediscover his true being and his likeness myself. And using different language helps me with that. So I call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua. And he had this really, really, really cool teaching that very few people actually understand. And he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, meaning I and the Father are one. Okay? And in that day, you know, you will know which is now, you will know that I am in you and you are in me. In the same way that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, so the Son is in the Father, the Father is in the Son, meaning they are one. Mm -hmm. This is actually the 
the doctrine of the Trinity. But it's, the doctrine of the Trinity has been completely misunderstood. I mean, it is, mean, it is saying that in the same way the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, so now you are in the... You've been grafted in and restored to your place in that idyllic garden before what Christians call the fall. Before the lie came that said you are not made in his likeness, but you can be by becoming a god of your own making and consuming the knowledge of good and evil. The fruit of the fall, the consequence of the fall, is judgment and grievance. <clears throat> That's our only problem, really the only problem we have today. But Jesus taught very, very clearly that I am in you and you are me. I mean, that's like saying this. See this bottle of kombucha? Kombucha. It's like him saying this. Here's, here's the mystery of it all and the truth. You can see the kombucha, this amber liquid I'm holding in my hand. The viewers can't see it because they're not viewers, they're hearers. But you can see that it's in the glass. But the truth is the glass is also in the kombucha, meaning they are one. It's kind of like a quantum reality. Mm -hmm. Well, you are one. So we are now one in him. This is our resurrection. This is our restoration. This is the good news to all of us that we are made in the likeness of God. We are remade in the likeness of God. But we stumble in darkness because we see ourselves other. We see ourselves separated. We see ourselves as beings not of light but of darkness and we stumble in that darkness because we don't see ourselves as spiritual beings only temporarily residing in these bodies but rather we see ourselves as the bodies taking occasional spiritual journeys mm -hmm. no no this is backwards you know you are a spiritual being everything else around you is just there for your pleasure is there for but to the extent that it has dominion over you, you are enslaved and it becomes your prison. So then your body becomes your prison rather than, rather than something that you can enjoy and love. You have to let go of that prison. You have to deny the prison. You have to let go, deny yourself, the false self, in order to be who you truly are. All traditions teach this. None as clearly is Yeshua. It's the only way that you can discover your true beauty the incredible power. He said this way. He, he said he said these, had these crazy sayings that nobody knows what to do with. And one of them was this. If you believe in my name, meaning if you place your identity in my identity. See, back then, my, a name was somebody's identity. If you place your identity in my identity, okay, which means realize who you truly are. Ask anything in my name, meaning in my, you as, in my identity, meaning ask anything as me, and it will be done. You can move mountains. You can walk on the water. You can heal illness. You can, you can, you can. Nothing is impossible for you. But the only way to abide in that vine, in that identity, is to let go of all other identities. And in letting go of those identities, you discover your true identity as the son of the father, as the daughter of the father. And there, nothing can stop you. There you are a king, you are a queen, you are, you are a son of God. We have, this is the good news. And yet we continue to stumble in darkness and we talk about this, we talk about that, we talk about the avocado, taste and see that he is good and so are you. This is, you know, <clears throat> and one of the beautiful things about, you know, always when I talk to you is, is this framework that you're talking about because <laughs> it's a framework that so many of us have rejected and and just so the listeners know you know my own personal relationship with Christianity was to say rocky at, at, at best would be a euphemism right yeah. I mean early on in high school I go with my parents on a trip to Italy and I was maybe 16 17 at that time and we didn't have any strong particular spirituality or faith. It was just kind of agnostic, maybe whatever. We didn't talk about it. Um, and at that point, I went to the Dungeons of the Inquisition out in a, in a few different places. Yeah. And I saw the most horrible, horrifying contraption. I mean, this is pre-Saw movies and all this shit that you see on TV, you know, yeah. about these torture, sadism movies. So I wasn't exposed to that. I don't watch those now either. But the things that I saw and the devices that were available and used in the name of 
protecting, promoting Christianity, torturing heretics yeah. was unbelievably shocking. I mean, mm. the things they would do to genitals, to every possible way. I remember one thing that would hold people in this incredibly uncomfortable position where like one arm was, your arms were like permanently attached to your legs in this awkward stretch position yeah. where you just died over many days in horrible excruciating pain as your back slowly separated itself from the from your hips you know and then other things where they would put burning pokers through your penis and yeah things they do to women's vaginas like insane things yeah. and so i at that point it set me off on this rampage you know yeah. and i would learn and i went deep into it and was just violently angry because i also yeah. was in texas at the time and we had so many christians and i say how could you follow this who promoted that what i saw there in in italy you know yeah. and i also saw other physical ramifications i had i had a, a a girlfriend at one point and i we had sex we made love with you know with this girl and she immediately was like full-on bawling and crying and i was like whoa 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 what's what's going on and she explained that the first time she had sex, when she lost her virginity, which was the only other time, she was doing it with a with a Christian boy. And immediately he finished and he started calling her. He's like, "You're a whore. You're a slut. I can't believe you led me to this temptation. You know, I can, you're I got to go to church. Get the fuck out of here." So this young girl, fifteen, yeah. loses her virginity. And so I saw these examples, these visceral examples that created this anger in me. You know, because I knew that didn't make sense. That had nothing to do with even if there was a God, you know, that wasn't a God that I was going to worship if that yeah. was the, if that was the ramification yeah. that came down. And so I, I followed that and I studied it and I studied it in philosophy or religion. I was a philosophy major in school, but then I had a really turning point moment where I took a bite of, of the actual experience itself. I went out to the desert. I went out with a shaman and I ate a bunch of mushrooms and took what I believe was some MDMA with the mushrooms. The shaman was kind of organizing it all. I felt my body evaporate. And then all of a sudden, I experienced something else. And I mm -hmm. experienced what that, you know, kind of a bridge between what heaven and hell might be. Looking back at our own life and seeing, oh my God, what did I do? You know, yeah. or looking back with this pride and love and joy and all that you experienced and all that you birthed and the light that you brought you know, that was a heaven and the other was this hell and there was something else beyond and beyond the body. This was a vehicle and all of these things started to come. And then, you know, slowly as I experienced more, I started to build more bridges, but still that bias, that anger yeah. had been there because I'd tasted, I'd seen the, the evil from it and I hadn't seen the good. I'd only seen what had come in the bad. And then really as our relationship <laughs> developed, the other side, the true meaning of these teachings, like what the potential and the sacred wisdom contained therein started to build up this yeah. whole different spectrum. And I think a lot of the listeners here now are somewhere along that journey, sure. you know, where they've maybe tasted some of the good. They've certainly seen some of the bad and they're along the way. But the the amazing thing, and I think the direction that the world is going is being able to bring all of these pieces together, find yeah. the beauty of Christianity, find the beauty in the teachings of Islam and all, Buddhism and spirituality and create an experiential place where all of these roads, they're all leading to a similar thing, if not the same exact thing. Well, I would say that Christianity as a religion has completely bastardized the teachings of Yeshua. I, he, and, and that's okay. That's just what happens. That's what man does. You know, um, he takes the mantle on himself, and and th then that religion becomes just another costume that covers up the, the light within, another the bowl. beauty. It's another bowl that covers up identity. In fact, Yeshua said, be, be, he warned, he said, be very careful. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and will deceive you. In other words, these are people like, well, let's take the Inquisition and Catholicism of that day, oh, um, their their understanding of religion and, and of Christ and all of that, Christianity of that day, they were representing to be, they were representing essentially his teachings and butchering people. So it was kind of like an antichrist, yeah, in that sense. I don't want to place labels on things, but it was... It, it was I, anti the true meaning. It was anti, it was actually completely opposite of his teaching. His teaching is to turn the cheek. His, when the evil man comes against you, do not resist him. 
was his teaching. Rather, turn the cheek. And um, this is a the, the, the art of non-resistance is is really beautiful when you, when you realize that actually you only realize your true identity and your safety when you let go of your de- your defenses. Because it's in doing that that you're letting go of your identification with body and understanding your... Invincibility. Yeah, I mean, it's like this. Here's the way I like putting it. It's almost like we're all Clark Kent's, okay? And <clears throat> Clark Kent has a suit, glasses, and he goes to an office every day. And let's say he's forgotten that he's Superman. He doesn't know he can fly. Someone then comes and taps him on the shoulder and says, Clark, you're actually not, this is just a costume you're wearing. This is the costume, the suit, these glasses. You can fly. And he goes, what are you talking about? No way. No, no, no. You're actually Superman. If you go down to the telephone booth there and strip out of this costume, you'll find that you're someone else. And that someone can fly. This is the place that we find ourselves in right now, in actually right now, as we're talking. Do we believe we're Clark Kent or do we believe that we are Superman? Where is your identity in this moment? And, you know, to the extent that we begin to realize who we truly are, that realizing who we are is a matter of letting go of who we aren't in our truest essence. So that is the pathway of surrender. Surrendering who you think you are to be who you truly are. And, and it's like, oh, that's like such a negative way. That's a, are you kidding me? You are letting go of the bars that imprison you to find that you are free. To believe in the name of Jesus means to place your identity in his identity and you will be saved. Saved from what? The storms that rise against you in this life right now. When you're in the midst of a heated argument with, you know, whoever, okay? Let's say right now you're, you're with a girl or you're with a, a guy and in romantic relationships, there's a great opportunity for conflict and great opportunity for joy and pleasure as well. Let's say you're in the middle of a heated argument. I can guarantee you at that moment, if, if you let go of your identity as a person who needs to be fulfilled a certain way in your body and connect and align yourself with your f- source, with your father as a spiritual being, it's a, you've done it many times. You're letting go of what you think you want find out you already have it, and then suddenly, it's like in a moment, the anger, the frustration falls away. You've experienced this, yeah? Of course. That is letting it's go. It's not easy, but it's... Well, it's, it's not, not easy for Clark Kent to believe he's Superman. <laughs> right. But that is the path. And that's the only way out of this, out of this prison. It's, right. There's no way to go below it. And so many times people take the opportunity to go below it more booze, more drugs, more escapism, go underneath that. Well, actually, that's all we do outside of the spiritual context. In other words, yeah, we, we say booze, drugs, sex, whatever. But the point of that, you can be as easily addicted to yourself as a, as a certain role. For example, mother. I am a mother. Hmm. What happens then when your children are taken away? You're crushed because your identity was in your motherhood. Nothing wrong with motherhood, but to the extent that's your identity then when that's taken away from you, you're left with what? You're nothing. Or let's say you're a rock star. Well, there's probably very few rock stars listening right now, but the point is you put your identity in that. When that's taken, what are you left with? Right. And ultimately, everything will be taken away from us. Obviously, it's called death. We're in the process of dying now. So what are you left with? Well, wouldn't it be beautiful if you could begin to live that in the vein of raw power and peace and love in spirit now, before you die. And this is the forgotten way of Yeshua. Yeah, to find peace in the midst of the storm. There's this t- t- story of his, I gotta tell a story. It's a crazy, crazy story, but it illustrates this so well. Yeshua is out in the middle of the storm with some of his followers. And the storm comes up and they're in the boat and he's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. Okay, now think of this incredible, beautiful sage, this master named Yeshua, sleeping, knowing he's the son of God. Okay? Now, 
His master, the disciples or the people with him wake him up and say, Master, save us. We're, the storm is going to crush us. And he asked them a question which is crazy. He says, why are you afraid? What do you mean, why am I afraid? Can't you see the cancer bearing down on me? Can't you see I just, we, I'm going through a divorce? Can't you see I have no money in my bank account? Can't you see, can't you see my children were just taken from me? Can't you see I'm not making it in life? He says, these are the storms that come against you. Why are you afraid, oh, you of little faith? And then he brings peace. The only reason why he's not afraid and his followers are is because what he sees is different from what they see. They are afraid for what they mistake as their true lives when he sees something very different. Wouldn't it be beautiful to be able to go through life right now and in any given situation be able to yeah, not feel or suffer or be crushed by the storms that rise up against in this life. By the way, those storms come up every day, many times a day. Some are very small, just frustration with a coworker. Some are very big, a breakup in a relationship. These are all just little storms. To the extent we identify ourselves in who we are not, we will be mastered by them and we will suffer deeply. And the, the most beautiful thing about Yeshua is that it is written of him that he himself came into alignment, meaning learned obedience, came into alignment with his father through his own suffering. So he took this same path. He had no advantage over us. And I think that's a super key point, is that he wasn't born. I think a lot of people think of him as born the son of Christ, this whole story of the virgin birth and all of this kind of thing, making him special, making him special from the drop, you know, and I think, and someone's, because that allows you to, you know, prop him up as something different than us. And I think the real power of this teaching is, is that he came out like any one of us and he found this truth that yeah. all of us can find himself through his suffering, through this yeah. journey and reach this place of pure source where his identity had dropped off other than that that diamond at the core nine dimensions deep in our heart that yeah. blinks in and out with quantum uncertainty there when we see it not there when we don't observe yeah. it identification purely with that center inside of us he came to that like any of us can potentially come to yeah the one thing i think my belief this is all very mysterious we cannot understand it in this context with you know with these minds that we have which are just they're just brains you know Consciousness resides out beyond the beyond these particular instruments called brains, but I believe that Yeshua came into this existence as an incarnation, giving up, though being found in the form of God, let go of all that and became. This is what's so beautiful. About it. He became just in every way, in every way, exactly like you and me, and took the journey as a man. So you see the spirit, the spirit coming into bodily existence so now <clears throat> he's taking the same path that you're taking mm -hmm. and having then let go of his body and teaching all those who followed do the same let go of all that you think you are to discover who you are only then can you follow me into that realm of the sovereign power and presence of who you are who your father is he called that eternal life now it's a realm it's like beyond, only then can you step beyond the matrix. It's a let go, Neo, of who you think you are. And go ahead and jump off that cliff and you'll discover something else. This is what Yeshua taught in many ways. And then his resurrection was ours. So how this all works in all, all of eternity, outside of space and time, I don't know. I just know that he showed me a way of letting go of who I thought I was to discover who I truly am. Now, what happens when you step into that place of power? What I'm interested in, Aubrey, is not just the rhetoric. Screw the rhetoric. It's just more talk. It's just another belief system. Show me that peace. Show me that unconditional love. Show me that healing touch. I mean, I've been... <laughs> the, the, the kinds of experiences that I'm... I'm just like a child learning to stump, step into this way and to open my eyes and see who I truly am in this process. It is my awakening. It is my evolution. 
it is my regeneration. It is my birthing. And birthing can be a bloody business, yeah? In fact, it is. <laughs> but in that process, uh, it's amazing. I mean, I've, I've to, to sit with a group of people, especially Christians, who many are blind and blo- lost, you know, I had to come, I had to make a New Year's resolution a few years ago. I realized I judge Christians more than anyone else. And so I was not practicing love. Who was I to talk about love when I judged Christians? This is just me going going back. Mm. I saw them as being the most judgmental of all judgmental of all people. And that went had very little to do it with them. And then I realized how judgmental I was being. And so I said, This year I have a new New Year's resolution. I'm going to learn to love Christians. And so I I then put myself amongst Christians and I looked at them in their place of worship doing their thing and my heart just broke for them these are people just doing the best they know how to reach out it's okay it is okay and i love them and i saw the beauty in them oh that you know what what a beautiful species these humans that will go to such lengths to do you know and i just loved them so much in that moment and began to (laughs) which broke like a 20-year cycle for me because i always kind of judged christians because why? Because they tend to be the inquisitors, mm-hmm. you know. Like you said earlier, uh, that that was my own journey, learning to actually be and experience the love, not just talk about it. So now, speaking to Christians, you know, it's like I'm drawn to help them step out of their darkness and their blindness to see who they truly are. They're just lost. They're like little birds, you know, with their mouths open, wanting to be fed. When I speak to them of the, lo- of the love of their father, it's beautiful to see them go, could it be true? <laughs> right. Yes, come, we are. And in also in, in those contexts and seeing things like people who have like the craziest stuff. I mean, people physically like just spontaneously healed. Seriously. I mean, and it's like, whoa, it's like just tapping into a power that we, we didn't have. I'm not like going around healing people. When, when, when people... Re- when they tap into their true identity, they it's they heal. Their bodies follow. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like the removing, power removing these blocks. The and, blocks and plugging back. If we were all iPhones, it's like plugging back into the cloud that has the perfect download system, you know, of our existence. But yeah. so many times we don't realize that there's a connection there available. And yeah, removing these blocks and connecting back with our Father, with Source, with God, with whatever that might be. We get to allow that download to start yeah. flowing and start healing our body and doing what we're capable of, that yeah. infinite place of power. And it's not just healing the body. I mean, and and th- that place of that place where you're connected with source will allow you to experience if, if you're into the pleasures and you haven't gotten through that yet, you know, it will allow you to experience far greater pleasures because you will get what you don't need anymore you know like your ability to access whatever you want if you want wealth if you want love at the minute you're not groping and grasping like a desperate animal for all of these things they'll come way easier to you as well so all things become available healing you know the enjoyment of the world the enjoyment of this all of that comes through connection with source and identifying with your true identity Um, and then everything becomes way simpler. All of the obstacles yeah. start to evaporate. I mean, th- these things, we call them supernatural, but really they're natural. And everything else is subnatural. You know what I'm saying? Natural is us being the sons and daughters of the Father, flowing with light and power. We're far more <laughs> powerful than we can begin to imagine. And this is written all through all through what is written in in scriptures it's the, it's there it's just nobody's paying it much attention because they've instead turned christianity into a religion and this is the same same is true with 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 the hindu religion with uh, islam i mean i grew sure. up amongst institutions institutions i mean islam is is, is, the, is the same way i mean i grew up among, you know 98% of indonesians of indonesia is is islam i mean they they too were lost in their blindness so but to actually see it then it's like, okay, I can't deny this. You cannot deny that power. So how do you see it, Ted? I mean, because a lot of people are listening now, and I know I have my ways. I talk about those ways all the time, and I talk about it as expanding your own consciousness. Your identity is is wrapped up in that same concept. And, and my ways have been many times down the psychedelic medicine path as well as some other modalities like floating and these things. But 
but how for you you know do you tell people how do you go and taste this and feel this and and put the avocado on your tongue yeah for me um for me it's my path has been one I mean, i've tried all kinds of things but for me it's simply i take on this process of simply um I going into time contemplation and the meditation and I let go consciously. I have this mind in me that was also in Yeshua who although being found in the form of God surrendered himself and became nothing. This is what's written of him, okay? For me that's a process I do it every morning where I and I do it through the day where I will go into a time of meditation and I say I see myself as no thing. I let go of things no self false self i let go of myself i de- that's denying myself i let go of my of the identity i have in this particular manifestation of me i let go of my relationships i mean purposefully i'm not no longer a husband i'm no longer a father i don't have children i don't i become nothing yeah and in that place i reconnect in a very real way with my true identity as the son of my father. Aubrey, in that time, I don't do the other modalities that so many people use, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. because I have the power within me to do it Mm -hmm. myself. And in that moment, in that time, I go, oh, yeah, oh, 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 wow. And my life, my whole body floods with this kind of gratefulness gratefulness is the greatest state of receivership and in that moment i feel very different than when i'm looking at myself as the owner of a business or an author with a, with a you know with a publishing concern or this or that and i realize that all those things are like just sandcastles that i'm building you know they're just my costume that it's could be gone tomorrow in that moment it doesn't matter to me whether or not my body is hurting or not hurting I don't identify with it. And in that place, great inspiration and creativity flows through me. In that, in, that, in that state, I cannot judge anyone. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. I see that I can love my neighbor as myself, not as much as myself, not as if they were myself, but as myself, because we are one. This is what Yeshua taught. In that state of being, I love myself without judgment. Why? Because I am the son of the Father. We see God now as in a mirror, it is written. Why? Because when you look at a mirror, you are seeing deep in your eyes the son, the daughter. You are seeing God in this reflection. And when we die, we will see him face to face. We will experience him in a new, more pointed way. So in this life, we are limited to some respects because we see, you know, our our vision is clouded. It'll never be as visceral as when we let go of his body completely but to the extent we let go of our body or in this life our identification with who we think we are in this life we experience who we truly are and then we see source god our father as in a mirror how can you dare look in the mirror and judge yourself how can you judge yourself for being too fat too skinny not enough this not enough do you feel like i just need to do more i'm not quite there this is a lie you are there you are complete already. You are already complete. This is one of Yeshua's teachings. You cannot be more complete than complete. Complete is complete. Your only problem is that you don't see yourself as complete because you have planks of grievance and a judgment that blind your vision for who you truly are. And so you see yourself as less than, not enough, but one day I will make it. No, this is a lie. And in seeing yourself as complete, you regain your own free will, true free will. You're not guided by these perceptions and desires and things you're running from or running towards. You know, when you see yourself as complete, not needing anything, when you have no needs, then at that point, recognize in recognition of your own complete, your own fullness of love. You don't need love elsewhere. You have it internally. Then you decide what your controlled folly is. Do I want to be strong and fit do i want to be skinny do i want to be fat do i want to eat lobster do i want to eat salads do i want to well whatever that is that becomes your choice and you you can enjoy it all 
freely without just being guided by these million fish hooks that have been planted by society and your psyche exactly. and your fears and your desires and all of these things pushing and pulling and prodding and instead you know recognizing your completeness recognizing your invincibility and then deciding hey where do i want to play today in this world's greatest fucking playground this eden that i find myself in how do i want to play you know, we have time. Look, oh, we got another 60 years before bedtime, you know. <laughs> Let's play. Let's dance. Let's experience each other. Let's experience these other reflections of ourself in as many ways as possible. Let's dance. Let's create. And that's ultimately, you know, I think what it comes down to when you're in that place, the love that you feel for the world and humanity, it comes down to how can I help other people and yeah. co-create in this experience. You know, really, a lot of people that I've seen who are successful and lost it's because they've lost that that initial drive. Why? Why am I doing this? Because they know the money isn't creating their happiness. It's not creating anybody else's. But they don't feel that natural empathy and that love for everyone else because they don't see them as themselves living a different life. Yeah. You know, they see them as other. They have this layer of judgment there. You know, and ultimately, the only thing that's going to bring that true satisfaction is what they say down in South America: "Para el bien de todos," for the good of all. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I be of service? Yeah. How can I minister, you know, to the world? And that's going to bring great joy. And yeah, sure. Eat the steak dinner on the way. Smack a, you know, smack a booty or two on the way. Have some fucking fun. It's fine. Do it. You know, you know, I, I, I would say this is what I've learned in my own experience. And that is anything in my life that separates me from my understanding and awareness of who I truly am doesn't serve me. So if a pleasure... This is where, again, I go back to what is written. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. So you get to examine, we get to each examine our lives and say, what distracts me from my identification of my true identity? Because in that true identity, centered, aligned with our true identity and our sword, our Father, as I, you know, that in that place, you have more power than you can imagine. And only then can you enjoy all the beautiful, let's face it, this world was created because I, I, I like saying, what well, you know why God created you? Because he wanted to drink coffee. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the, it's the very, this world exists because <laughs> for experience. It allows infinite expression. For, ex, and, and experience. experience yeah. and, and, but but you, can only, uh, you can only experience eternal life, abundant life, full of joy, peace, and power by knowing, by experiencing the Father, your source, God himself, he in you, you in him. So anything that distracts you from that purest, that purest identification in your true self is, doesn't serve you. So, so many pleasures in this life, <clears throat> you know, they, they're beautiful unless they're not. Yeah. It's like coffee. It's like gluttony. Let's take gluttony, one of the seven deadly sins, yeah? And yet our whole culture is gluttonous to the extent that it distracts us. Consume, 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 eat, eat. Not just food, gluttony. Why? Because we're trying, all, it, all gluttony does is ultimately we're trying to find something in this life to give us significance that will save us from our own sense of insignificance. So we have to pack more on. And so that pleasure does not become something that ultimately satisfies us. It becomes something that masters us. You can let go, as you and I say often, you know, you can have all that you want as soon as you no longer crave it or need it or even want it. Mm -hmm. There is so much heat on that saying. Then you can actually, for the first time, enjoy truly the pleasures of life yeah. and that That's that means freedom. letting go of them in a way first not just in a way but kind of completely and that is the path that is the path of discovering your true nature of divinity partakers of the divine nature it is it's a beautiful beautiful path uh, unfortunately or fortunately actually it's just a birthing process we only discover that when when the, the things we think would save us or give us significance, ultimately fail us. And usually, this happens in the second half of life, 
after you've gone after it and gone after it and gone after it and you see that person who's now, now 50, 60, 70 and they're like, crap. <laughs> their, their, their stare is kind of blank. They have, all, they have it all, but they're just, uh, just, you know, and now we're describing 99.99999% of all of humanity. <laughs> but it doesn't have to wait that long. It do, that's you the whole start, point. You can start. I mean, anybody listening here, anybody that, and it's something that we're talking about constantly in our own ways, it can start right now. In fact, that's the big change that's happening now, I think, throughout the whole world, is people are beginning to awaken to their 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 true potential and their true identity now while they're younger. It, it's a shifting, in, I think, in terms of, it's it's almost like the whole world is starting to grow up and to evolve into this new space place of being. Um, it's very, very exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, people change from either inspiration or desperation, and typically it's been desperation that's caused it. Like you said, great suffering, great dissatisfaction that creates it, and it's still a very powerful force. But I think people are now changing from inspiration. They're recognizing the truth, even when things aren't shit. You know, things are, yeah, pretty good, but whoa, this is amazing. I've felt this. I've touched this. This is something I want to pursue, and they're inspired to to make you know to awaken in these ways and that's a really exciting exciting point yeah i was in a meeting <clears throat> recently where a guy got up on stage his pathway was one of surrender a meditation and in that place of meditation surrendering much like i was just talking about mm -hmm. a very unique pathway um his name was tate and he got up he was called up on stage and uh, I don't know if some any of you are familiar with a guy named Joe Dispenza, but this mm -hmm. is actually one of his workshops. And I was just curious, so I just went. And there he got up and he talked about the fact that he got up there and he said, he said, I began this practice four months ago. And he began to cry. He said, I was born without a muscle in my shoulder. And he pointed to his shoulder. And you could see he was, he was a fit guy because he had worked his whole life. He had to compensate for this deformity he had. This zero, no muscle. Like this one muscle is just completely missing. And he said, I came into this place where I surrendered. This, everything that I thought I was, it became no thing. No. And, and in that moment, suddenly this incredible heat <laughs> ignited in my shoulder. And he says, in the last four months, every morning I'm getting up and I'm entering the state of meditation, that muscle has grown regenerated three inches and it's still growing and the heat's still in there right now he said i'm i'm documenting it day by day i'm making a documentary of my process and of he says the strangest thing and he's up there and he says i you know this is crazy it, it was only in my complete surrender of everything i thought i was that i entered the space and he said the strange thing is i went to the airport I went to the airport i went through the radar detectors, whatever you call them, TSA there, and it went off. And I looked around on the screen and it was, you know, this yellow dot. And so they're patting my shoulder saying, what's, you have, do you have a, do you have a metal plate in there? No. And I realized it's just the, the raw, it's, it's, it's just the power, the energy. This, and it was still, it's, it's never, the heat's never left me. And he says, every single time I've gone to an airport since then, it's gone off. <laughs> now, this is what we're going to see more and more and more and more of as we begin as we continue to awaken and the only way can we can awaken into our true identity is to let go of false identities it's the only way this is what yeshua meant when he said i am the way the truth and the life the only way to the father meaning the only way to to identify with your true nature is to let go of all others and only then can you actually truly enjoy and love this life and what a beautiful life it is. What a beautiful life it is. Ted, my brother, <laughs> this has been a pleasure. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, you guys, your listeners are probably, you know, they're probably not used to someone coming on here talking so much about Yeshua. But I, 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 I think great. That there's I mean, so much that, beauty in absolutely. his teachings that have been completely bastardized by religion. And it's like, ah, no, let's strip that away, guys. And go back to these incredible teachings and so full of power and beauty because oh oh my god they uh they, they work they're amazing are you writing something now that's going to you know be another source for people to to get access to you know what you've been talking about 
I am. I've been working now quite some time um, on a manuscript called The Forgotten Way, which is, the subtitle is The Path of Yeshua for Power and Peace in This Life. You know, not, not the just next. waiting for the next one. But yeah. in this life, right. because so many of his teachings, really, we've mistaken to think they're all about something. You know, that's where Christianity kind of sits. Well, we're, we're saved in the next life. All that, but that's not, most of his teachings were not about that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's, it's yeah, it's a, whole, it's a whole different way to look at his teachings in a very, very powerful way. That, and actually, this particular book I'm writing is for all those in religion who are lost, stumbling, hurt, wounded, and confused about why their system of belief doesn't actually serve them so well in this life and how they're actually... None of the things that they thought would manifest in their lives have been manifested. By the way, in the New Age community, I also noticed, and many teachers are now starting to say this, this, this whole secret, I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, this no one, secret... No one here to offend, Ted. I don't want you know, if you're into the secret, that's fine. But the fact is, you can't manifest anything until you give everything up. So the pathway is surrender. The, the power, you know, you realize people aren't, aren't actually manifesting. Is I mean, they kind of are. And like, they're, they're attributing things. Oh, look, this happened, this happened. Oh, it's all working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, after a decade of that, it's like people are waking up, just like in Christianity, and saying, well, actually, we're not really di that different from anybody else. This power, it sounded good, but it's not actually working. Right. As like, like it's supposed to. And it's because they're asking out of this false identity. They're not really asking that true power within themselves. Mm -hmm. They're still striving and desiring to, to build up their own craving. craving for what they want, what they think they want. Well, you get to let go of that to discover you already have and are. Oh, oh, I see. That is the pathway of surrender. Surrender who you are not to see who you are. Hmm. All of these institutions, when they become institutions, have have weaknesses. I yeah. mean, and I think that's the that is the forgotten way. The forgotten way is to get rid of all of that. Yeah. Strip all of that down. Realize that these structures and the, these semantics and all of that, they're things that just really separate us from the truth and it's the state of being. work. You know, it's 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 okay to everyone will take their own journey and that's and that's beautiful. Their journey is where they are right now in their job, in their relationship, whatever. But these core fundamental teachings are the same. And, and it, it is a very, very simple path that, that, that we get to follow, whether we choose to or not, it doesn't matter. It's still a path you will take and ultimately we will all die. Mm. And that is the final letting go of who you think you are. <laughs> it's <laughs> right? the forced one. <laughs> it's the forced one. It, the, the, it's like, it's funny. It, there's a saying in one tradition, I forget which one, I think it might be Buddhist, <clears throat> that says there are three pathways to surrender, three pathways to enlightenment. Okay. One is the monastery where you go and you choose to the, let go of yourself to discover who you are. The second is prison where you're forced to go to escape your suffering. The third is marriage. <laughs> we'll say relationship. And um, marriage, you know, you can be married to your job, you can be married to your passion, whatever it is. In other words, but specifically relationship, this is the crucible of all transformation. It's like, yeah, you know, we're all kind of in that place. We're learning to let go of all that we think will give us satisfaction and letting go of all what we think will save us, quote, save us in this life. And that includes relationship, that includes jobs, that includes our bodies, that includes everything. Because they're all going to ultimately and are already, in a sense, dying, no matter how long and hard we fight to keep them. So be who you already are today and flow with power as the light of the world. And that is my word to me and you, brother. Indeed, my friend. <laughs> Indeed. People can find you. you got an active Facebook page. Yeah. You've got a ton of books. And this new one that's coming out is going to be a game changer. And I can't, I can't fucking wait. And I know a lot of these people can't wait as well. So thank you, Ted, my brother. It's been it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Albert. I have to do this again. We could probably <laughs> record <laughs> record months of podcast time yeah. in between us. But um, thank yeah. you for everything that you brought, and thank you for everything that you brought into into my life. I wouldn't quite be, you know, exactly the same person as uh, as I am now if it wasn't for a yeah. lot of the things that you showed me along the way. So, thank you and much love, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you.